if I was to say, what is something that I sense God is saying? He says, we need to learn to take our thoughts captive. We need to learn to gain control of our emotions. So today's message is entitled this, Change Your Life by Changing Your Mind. Now, in Jimmy's message last week, he talked about how our body goes just, it, 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 it's constantly living and dying. Our cells are reproducing themselves. And he says, so what we think about literally affects our health. So he, sa- he talks about how we have these neurotransmitters. They're like sponges. And then what we take in physically, but also what we take in emotionally and intellectually changes our body's composition. So these neuroreceptors are like sponges. He said, so if you're thinking positive thoughts, if you're thinking not just happy thoughts, but when you're thinking, you're, you have a mental outlook, you, you're positive, uh, your, your neurotransmitters cr- are, create these like sponges that says, uh, feed me more positive thoughts. And then they double, literally, your cells die. So how you stay alive is they're, they're reproducing. So they reproduce according to their kind. And so you, your neurotransmitters produce these positive things. But if you're the Eeyore and you're sitting there thinking of no good, not worthy, no one loves me, uh, life is hell on earth, guess what's going to happen? You're going to create sponge receptors that say, That's what you're going to be if you don't change the way you are. They're going to double. They're going to multiply. So we want to do this. We, right now, you know, how how many of you know God's plan for you is to prosper you? John 10.10, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Now, we're going to talk about your ability to enjoy life today. See, a lot of it has to do with this little thing right here. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But Satan comes to do what? kill, steal, and destroy. I tell you right now, Satan is called the father of lies, and what he's going to do is he's going to pull out every every card game, every trick, every deception, every half-truth, and he's going to lie to you, and his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to rob you of your ability to experience life and experience life to its fullest. Now, God doesn't just want you happy, because see, happy is kind of dependent on your circumstances. But what God wants you to do is experience peace of mind. He wants you to experience joy. Because, see, peace of mind and joy come from beyond your situation, beyond your circumstances. And so, a person, let's, let me pull up a scripture real quick. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In other words, you're able to experience peace and rest and confidence because you trust in Him, you trust in God. How many of you know your circumstances in life are going to change? They're going to be up, they're going to be down, they're going to be good, they're going to be bad. But a person who knows how to walk with the Lord, have God as the center of His confidence, the center of His strength, is able to, in good times or in bad, learn to experience joy. Because sometimes, even as a believer, you're able to worship God in the midst of the most horrendous, difficult situations because you trust in God. You trust in God's love for you. you. You trust in what God says about you. You trust that God has a plan for the future for you. And so you're not, you're not driven, your emotions are, are not driven by your situation. How many of you know we can always trust our emotions? Right? No, you can't. Now, there's two extremes. There are those where their emotions dictate their every whim. Right? And and if I put a, a group of people, it's the artsy, creative, it's a gift from God. But if you don't learn to control your emotions, your emotions will control you. On the other extreme are those who, who say that I don't need emotions and they stuff their emotions and they're not emotional. How many of you know you die early when you do this? Because God created you as an emotional, thinking, feeling being. All right? And again, just to stuff your emotion is not a good thing. So it's somewhere we have to learn to allow us to have emotions, but not to let our emotions run amok. And all emotions are based on a truth or a lie. Right? So what we have to do is we have to learn to be able to discern what is true and let our truth guide us 
and give us the ability to enjoy life. His mind is stilled on God, on him, and he will keep us in perfect peace. Perfect peace in the midst of storms, ups and downs, tragedies, good times, bad times. It's learning to be content. You know what content is? Content is, is, is having or not having, and your happiness is, or fulfillment or your joy or your peace is not dependent on your situation. God is more interested in changing your mind than he is in changing your situation. Many of us want God to change our spouse or give us a different one or we made the wrong choice or maybe it's a different job. You know, I want a different job. If I had a better job, I'd be happy, all right? Or, or maybe my finances. Your fi- more finances, less finances. Nobody usually likes less finances. Uh, <clears throat> but do you un- are you tracking with me? So what happens is what we need to do is change our thinking. Let me give you an example of a job. If you have a particular problem and in your life and you have a boss and your boss identifies that problem and all of a sudden, you, God, I need a different job. And God says, you don't need a different job. You need to deal with your problem. And then what happens is you, you, you leave that job and you go find another job. Guess what's happened? If you don't deal with the issue in your life, then that, that problem's going to re- and you're going to go from job to job to job, or I'm going to go from marriage or relationship to relationship to relationship, and until you deal with those issues, it's just going to keep surfacing. So we're going to talk today, if you want to change your life, you have to change your thinking. We know from a scientific background, which I put the Bible above science every day, uh, if you want to change your life, you want to change those receptors, Let's over the next two months begin to take control of our thoughts and our emotions. And let's begin to take what God says about your situation and begin to believe it, feed that, and it's going to change you. I'm going to use a story of, a, of a, which I've used many times. It's really the best one I know uh, there, uh, as far as an illustration. This talks about the nature of man. Okay? There was a missionary who went into Africa. True story. And when he went there, he led a, a tribal group to the Lord. And uh, communism was coming into the, the country. And so he had a young man he had been discipling. And he gave him his only Bible, led the, led the man to the Lord, gave him his Bible, and told him as much as possible how he could stay successful. But he knew he had to flee the country or he'd be put to death in just a few days. So it wasn't until about 20 years later this missionary was able to return back to that country thinking there probably was nothing there. But what he did is it was the opposite. He found a thriving, healthy group of believers in that small community, and the man that he had left in charge was just had become a radiant, godly man, had led that community and that church into to walking with the Lord. So he asked, them, how, did you, how did you succeed? How did you win? You had very little. He says, well, he says, now I'm going to, so the, the, this, this African man was asked, how did you succeed? He says, well, I'm going to talk to you about the, my, what happened to me. He says, in my, prior to Christ, I was controlled by my carnal nature, my, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. He says, I, I li- this is who I was. And he says, I was blind to, I, I could not see the truth. It was beyond me. He says, and so that thing controlled my life. But then when you came in, you shared the gospel. It's like my eyes were opened up and I received Christ. He says, so there was something new inside of me. Here's the dark side of my my carnal nature. He says, then when Christ came in, my eyes were opened. I saw for the first time the truth, light. He says, so I saw two dogs at war. I saw this dog, which was my carnal nature, that if I fed it, it controlled my life. He says, but when Christ came into life, my life, I started spending time reading the Word. I started praying. I started memorizing Scripture things you'd ask me to do, and I found that this puppy, which was the presence of Christ living in me, this thing grew strong, and this thing began to lose power and control over my life. And he says, so I found that there was an ongoing battle every day of my life, and he says, whatever I fed, won. Let's all repeat those things. Whatever I feed, wins. Let's do it one more time. Whatever I feed, wins. You can either feed your carnal nature and listen to the lies of the enemy, and Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's going to plant thoughts into your life that no one loves you, you're not good enough, you're not worthy. Why don't you just kill yourself? How many of you know that's from the pit of hell? 
That's a lie. God says, I love you. You're my favorite child. I have great plans for you. Now, we're going to kind of use as our illustration the story of David. David was a man, it says David was a man after God's own heart. So David as a young man, first of all, was rejected by his family. Didn't come, he, came up, he grew up in a dysfunctional family. How many of you know we all grew up in a dysfunctional family? Because sin. Some of us came a little bit more than others. But we all have to deal with stuff. And, and again, we're going to talk about how to live successfully. So David grew up rejected by his family. Saul's the king. Saul has a great call, but Saul doesn't see himself what, as God sees himself. And so he starts doing stupid things. And so ultimately Saul, because of his sin, because of his unbelief, he doesn't believe what God says about him. Saul makes a lot of bad decisions. And ultimately God takes the anointed to be king away from him. Uh, not his kingship yet, but the anointing to be king. And he says, I'm going to anoint a young man. He says, I see a young boy who is worshiping me, who's taking his cues from me. And he says, God looks at his heart, not at his outward appearance. So God anoints young David to be the king of Israel. Now, David's kind of put on a shelf. It's like, okay, you anoint me king. What happened next? You know, David later on hears of this David's just walking with God out there taking care of the sheep. He hears of this, this soldier named Goliath and the Philistines attacking Israel. You know, he's got a little something in him called the warrior spirit. How many of you know God created men to be warriors? Amen. So, so this young boy wants to go see the fight. And so when he gets there, he sees a nation gripped with fear. A nation gripped with fear. And what David does is he says, guys, what in the world is wrong with you guys? Because he hasn't been told that God can't do something. He, all he's known is God can, right? So, so young David goes out, kills Goliath, and just, just destroys him. He, he confronts his fear, and he doesn't choose to think what everybody else is thinking. He chooses to think what God thinks. And he aligns his mind with what God's mind is, and he goes out and kills Goliath. And guys, every one of us are going to have the Goliaths of our life. But what's going to be the one that determining factor is what you think and God think need to be in alignment. Because Satan's out there and he's going to put thoughts in you that you can't or you shouldn't or you're not good enough or you're not worthy. He wants to kill you. Let's just get rid of it. Satan wants to kill you. So, so what David does is David goes out and he, he begins to be successful. He begins to walk with God, the favor of God. How many of you know when the favor of God starts falling on you, other people don't like it and they start opposing you? So what happened is David starts being Saul's assistant, kind of. David starts, he's got a warrior, so Saul sends him out to, to kill some Philistines. David kills the Philistines. Pretty soon, David's gaining a reputation. David kills his thousands, or Saul kills his thousands. David kills his ten thousands. Now a king is intimidated by a little boy because that little boy walks with God, Right? Guys, you're going to walk with God, Lee. There are going to be people who intimidate and just have a problem with you, and you're going, what did I do wrong? Because the presence of God lives within you. And God's going to bless you if you'll walk with him. And so what happens is, is David actually has to flee for his life. And Saul is now trying to kill him. So for seven years, David is running around the desert. And every day he gets up knowing that Saul's trying to kill him. Now what happens is a lot of people from Saul's army and those under his reign begin to hear of David and they know that David's been anointed to be the next king of Israel and they start leaving Saul and joining David. The misfits, the good, the bad, the ugly, they all, they all come. And what happens is pretty soon, can you imagine David every day knowing that Saul wants to kill you? Now first of all, all Saul had to do was send a spy in to the troop. One of the people leaving and just said, man, all I need to do is get close enough to David. I can stick my spear in him. Or maybe all I need to do is cause a revolt among the people. Or maybe I just take some, I'll fix his food. I'll, I'll work in the kitchen and I'll poison him. You know, in those days, you want to get rid of a king? Don't throw a spear at him. Just put it in his food. Knock him out. Can you imagine every day, not only David, but David's family, those with him and those without they're trying to be put to death. So David learned, had to learn how to overcome fear. How many of you know fear is one of the most crippling emotional things? So Ann Landers, a popular uh, columnist, 
back when before email, she would get on average over 10,000 emails or 10,000 letters a day asking advice. The number one most requested thing for advice was, how can I overcome my fear? How many know fear can cripple you, can destroy relationships, stop you from doing anything in your life? Guys, how many of you know fear is an emotion? Can you trust fear? So, how did David learn to overcome his feelings? How did David learn to overcome the, the threat of my, the guy sleeping beside me tomorrow could kill me? Is he had to put his confidence in his relationship with God, and he could not let his circumstances dictate how he was feeling. In fact, most of the book of Psalms was written out of David's time when his emotions were running amok, and he had to learn how to control them. So we're going to talk today about learning how to manage your thoughts and manage your emotions. Whatever you feed wins. If you feed this and let your mind go and your emotions go amok, it will win. But if you feed the righteousness of Christ, you feed the truth of Christ, you walk with God, you believe God, then what's happening is you're going to be able to discern what's right and wrong. You're going to be able to enjoy life. Romans 12, 2, key to transformation. God is more interested in changing your thinking than he is in changing your circumstances. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, that which is acceptable, that which is perfect. So why should I learn to manage my mind? Is it an important issue? Is it an important issue for us to parents to teach our children how to get control of their emotions? If we allow a child every time somebody says, you're not pretty, if you don't teach them, sweetie, does it really matter what anybody says? You know daddy loves you. You know you're pretty. And if you let every time somebody says something to you affect you, you're, you're just going to have a miserable life. Let's get control of those emotions and rein them in. Because you know what? You're daddy's favorite child. I told all my children, all four of them, you're my favorite child, and you're my favorite child, and you're my favorite child, and you're my favorite child. Amen? Why should I manage my emotions? Because if I don't, people will manage my emotion. Popular opinion will uh, 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 control my mind. Pressure will control my mind and my emotions. Or whatever demonic activity is going on in the world, uh, or whatever other people think, that's what's going to control it. You have to control who is in control of your mind, and you're the only person that can do it. Why do I need to manage my mind? Number one, because my thoughts control my life. Proverbs 4.23, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. You want to change your life? It'd be nice if God changed your circumstances, but that's not going to change your life. What's going to change your life is when you change this. In Proverbs it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. If you think you're no good, you probably will be. If you think you're God's favorite child, set apart, protected, yet be able to be teachable, correctable, you can do a lot for God's kingdom and enjoy life. Number one, because my thoughts control my life. Number two, because my mind is the battleground for sin. <clears throat> Again, the two dogs. Whatever I feed wins. <clears throat> you got, m m many of you have been, Grace, been here a long time, so you've heard my story. So let's pretend that we, we all have love eclairs. Anybody ever had a really good eclair? All right. I want you to think about it. Can you smell it? Okay. We're close to dinner, so it's, okay. Suppose we have an air eclair. One eclair is not a bad thing. But anytime I give myself to a desire that's out of bounds, it always causes devastation. So I eat eclairs, I eat eclairs, I eat eclairs. Pretty soon I have an eclair problem, <laughs> right? Now, to such a degree that I go to the doctor and the doctor says, son, if you don't stop eating eclairs, you're going to have a heart attack and die. And what's going to happen is you're, it's going to affect your family. It's going to affect everything about you, all right? You've got an eclair problem and you ne just need to stop, all right? Says, scripture says, do not be entangled again in the sin that so easily entangles you. All right? 
How many of you know, for some people, one, what they do is not sin? For you, an eclair is a sin. Okay? So we, we have an eclair problem, right? So, I, so I've avoided, I, I've, I've memorized scriptures on do not eat eclairs, you know. <clears throat> yeah. And not to look lustfully upon eclairs, you know, all, all the things. But the one day I have to pull into the gas station, and I've not been going by the bakery because I know I have an eclair problem, right? So one day I pull in the gas station, I go in, and the pump doesn't work, so I have to go inside and pay, and they have a new Krispy Kreme eclair counter. <laughs> How many of you know sin will follow you, all right? So, so what happens is I don't, I, I just, oh, ooh, that smells good. Oh, yeah, amen, Jesus' name, amen, you know. So, so I walk away. The next day I go, man, you know, there's this little, little something lodged here. You know, the smell, the look, the counter, the shape, the clear, you know. And then I go, man, man, I, be, I, better, I have to drive to town, out of town. I better get some extra gas. So I, I, I walk in. Rather, I, just, I don't even check to get my receipt outside. I, I go inside and I just, the whiff of the, the eclair. You guys, are you tracking with me? See? So it's just like this. Most people don't sin just when they see something for the first time. But as they, they, they play with it. And then that, what happens is the next day my wife says, hey, Randy, you know, you, we're going to have some guests over. Do you want to run by the, the grocery store and give something or some dessert or something? I'm going, yeah, I'll just run to the bakery. Do you, do you see where we're going here? And then I walk in the bakery and I go to look at the brownies and the pies. But I notice over to there, the smell of the eclairs have just come out of the oven. And it's building on me. And then I, I buy a pie, but all I'm thinking about is eclairs. And you know what? The next day I'm going, <laughs> I give up. I go buy the stupid eclairs, and all I am is a heart attack on a stick waiting to happen. How many know stupid is one decision away? Stupid that could destroy your life is one thought, one decision from happen. You remember David? David was a mighty man of God. God promoted him. God blessed him. Then there was a time when David was here. He, God's anointing to be a warrior was on him. And then the, all the men in, the, in his ranks said, David, why don't you take a break? Man, you've been fighting. Just, just chill for a little bit. And so it says when the, king, when the men went out to fight battle, David stayed at the, at the, at the castle, at the, at the, at the, on the walls. And then one day, David's bored because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And David is out walking around the palace there. And he happens to notice somebody bathing. And rather than walking away, he smells the eclair. Now, we don't know that this happened. But I know I'm a sinner, so I know what sin's like. You know what sin's like. So David probably didn't do anything. But the next day, he probably had some reason, or maybe just by accident. How many know Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy? David is out there again, and he happens to see Bathsheba taking a bath. And the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is kicking in gear. The old dog is starting to gain some traction. And then maybe day after day, he's bored. What he does is David, Uri the Hittite, is, is listed among David's mighty men of God. He knew him well. He was a good friend. So what David does is he sees Bathsheba. He brings her into his palaces. He seduces her. He rapes her. And then later she finds out she's pregnant. And so rather than trying to just cover up his sin, now he has to go to great... How many of you know sin will always find you out? Stupid is just one decision away. So David ends up killing Uriah the Hittite and the judgment that affected his life for and his family for the next 40 years follows him because of one bad decision. Because David didn't take time to take his thoughts captive. They took him captive. Now, guys, one good thing is, is how many of you know God is a God of forgiveness? God can, can he, he's a God of the second chance. When David was confronted with his sin, he didn't try to run from it. He confronted it. Did it cause, was there a consequence for his sin? Yes. But it, could you imagine if David hadn't turned back to God and repented? Guys, right now, I want to challenge all of us. God wants to change our thinking. 
God wants to get a, help us to learn to put some boundaries on our mind. So, why do I need to manage my mind? Because my mind, my thoughts control my life. Number two, because my mind is the battleground for sin. Again, the war. I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned. Yes. But there is also something deep within me that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to sin within me. In my mind, I want to be God's servant, but instead I find myself enslaved to sin. Whatever you feed wins. Number three, the key for you to experience peace and joy, peace and happiness, is for you to learn to manage your mind. Romans 8, 6, it says, if your sinful nature controls your mind, there's death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is what? There's life and there's peace. Again, let's talk about your circumstances. Some of us think that we should be happy based on our circumstances. The key to happiness is not having better circumstances. Now, does it help? Oh, my gosh, yes, it does. But if you can only be happy when everything's right and perfect, you're never going to be happy. But if you learn to be content, really let's use the word joyful or at peace with God. Because when you're at peace with God, even when everything else, when you, you've lost a loved one, when, 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 when someone that you're married to has been unfaithful, when you've lost a job, when you, you we have a child that's sick, when you have the list of stuff that goes on, there's been an accident, there's been a tragedy, there's been a financial loss. How many of you know life is going to dish those out? But if you have the ability to walk with God and not allow fear and your emotions to control you, but you control them, then you can worship God in the middle of a prison cell and be at peace and experience in life. Can I get an amen? You get to decide your peace. Satan's going to come and tell you, you're no good, you're no worthy, just kill yourself. You know, that's the most selfish act in the world. It is. It's a, it's, a, it's a decision that you make that's permanent that you can't change. And you know what the bad thing is? Statistics say that when a person chooses to commit suicide, those that know him or family, there's likelihood of 65% of somebody in the next 20 to 30 years is going to do the same. Why? Because of your bad decision. Don't do it. Walk away. If you got an eclair problem, don't go by the eclair counter. And how often are you going to have to do it? Every day. So how do you have a healthy mind? Number one, you have to feed your mind with the truth. Number two, you have to free your mind from confusion or just what I call excessive collateral junk. And number three, I have to focus my mind on what I know God has called me to focus my mind on, things on the truth. I have to feed my mind, free my mind, and focus my mind. Number one, feed my mind the truth. Jesus daily had, was God's servant. He was God's son. He God himself. But Jesus himself knew that he couldn't accomplish all that he needed to do unless he spent time with God's, in God's word. So this is what Jesus did. It says, while it was yet early, Jesus would get, get up every day. Everybody say every day. Every day and go spend time with God. But Jesus, even then, he says, he says, how can I accomplish God's will? How can I know God's will? Matthew 4, 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus knew for him to experience all that God wanted to do, he had to spend God's time in God's word. So when should I feed my mind? All the time. Every day. Not just on Sunday, one time a church, a week. You know, just think about it. If you only spend an hour at church or an hour and a half at church, and then you try and go and live out all the other hundreds and hundreds of hours, which one's going to win? Whatever you feed wins. But if you begin to put every day time in God's Word and have relationship with God, and you feed the righteousness of Christ within you, whatever you feed wins. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's look at some scriptures. Psalms 119, David speaking here. Psalm 119, 140, I rise early to cry out for help, to put my hope in your what? Your words. Not what my situation's dictating, but what God's word says. 
Psalms 119 verse 97. Lord, how I love your word. I think about it how often? All day long. In other words, David knew that the people that were trying to kill him, trying to poison him, trying to destroy him, destroy his family, he couldn't control. But what he could control is what God said about him. And God says, I will watch over you. I will protect you. I will defend you. I will protect your family. And all, it's like, you want, you want to have God protect your family? Walk with God. Get this thing under control. You want to enjoy your family? It's just like this. The key to you enjoying, it's like this. Take time to smell the roses, guys. Life is, man, you think, I, I, I look at, my, we just had a little grandbaby who's over there. No, she's not there. She is over there. I remember when my kids were so little. But if you don't take time to enjoy what God gives you, it will go right on past you. And right now, guys, life is bombarding us with so much stuff. Okay, so one, I need to, I need to feed my mind all the time. It's the key to victory. Psalms 119, verses 9 and 11. David speaking. How can a young man keep his way pure? God's word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. Guys, the key to enjoying life, the key to, to avoiding the eclair counter is to put God's word into your mind and let it be there all the time and stop stinking thinking. So number one, I need to feed my mind God's truth. Number two, I must free my mind from destructive thoughts. Satan's goal is to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Do not be entangled again in the sin that so easily entangles you. Satan's going to send every possible lie, deception, half-truth, trying to get you to go down the path of eclair thinking. He's going to tempt you. He's going to, he's going to pull all the plugs. Now, free my mind from destructive thoughts. What we have to do is, is, folks, if you picked up a newspaper today, let's say you picked up the Washington Post or uh, USA Today, they would say this, there's more, you know, it says in the last days before God returns, there will be an increase of knowledge, information. Today, if you picked up the USA Today and you read it with all the stock markets and the wars and the conflicts and the assassinations and all the Hollywood drama, you know, that's all true, right? Right. There's more information on the front page of the USA Today than there was that a person experienced, let's say, in his entire life in the 16th century. In the 16th century, he was worried about, well, there's been a plague for five years. Someone died down the street. There's a new king. Can you imagine? Guys, you pick up your phone and you say, hey, which restaurant should we go? We have 25 options. Let's talk about options. You know, there's so much information now. If you don't learn to control what you allow, how many of you know we need to put a filter on so much stuff and not, re, not, not feed this stuff? This stuff will just consume you. It'll fill your time. It'll take your time from God. But if you say, I'm going to pr provide time where I think on the right things and only allow into my mind this stuff. Let's say we want to go out to dinner. So we have 27 different restaurants. We have 20. Then, then each restaurant has all the opinions of which, what was good. And it, oh, they had hair in there. Oh, my God, don't go there. You know. Or they, had, they sold eclairs. All right. Or then let's say we choose a restaurant after we spent an hour looking for which restaurant. We went and ate a cheeseburger. Okay, come on. Okay. Then, then we say we're going to run to Walmart. We need to pick up some things. We need to pick up some toothpaste and some toilet paper. We go to the toothpaste counter, and there's a wall of toothpaste that you put in your mouth, you scrub, you, okay, and spit out, right? So there's, there's minty, minty fresh there's spearmint, there's bacon soda, there's scrub soda, what, whatever. And it's like, I, I just want toothpaste. And you can, it's like, the, there's so much stuff that you, just give me toothpaste. Okay? Or let's pull up toilet paper. There's soft, there's bouncy soft, there's extra soft, there's stretchy, I don't know. <laughs> right? All right. I must free my mind from destructive thoughts. How many of you know Satan's going to put in some bombshells? You know, uh, I've heard it said many times. You, it's like this. Um, 
Satan is the, uh, the, the god of lies, the god of flies. He's the god of deception. So how does temptation work? Temptation comes from James 1, 14 and 15. says, temptation comes from the lure of evil desires. Again, a desire. Then desires lead to evil actions, and evil, evil actions lead to death. So all temptation, it's like you can't stop Satan from tempta- tempting you, but you can. It's like this. You can't stop the birds of the air from flying over, but you can stop them from landing in your hair and making a nest and pooping. Because I promise you, whenever you allow Satan to land, he's not just going to make a nest. He's going to leave some deposits that are going to affect your life every time. Not sometimes, but every time. So this is how temptation works. Temptation always starts with a a right desire. How many of you know the ability to enjoy pleasure is God-given? To enjoy pleasure outside of God's boundaries from Satan. And it always leads to death. So it goes to, first of all, desire. And then it goes to doubt. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Did God really say we shouldn't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? You begin to question it. Well, just smelling the eclairs won't hurt. Looking at the eclairs won't hurt. How many of you know it will? Then deception. You bite into the deception. You bite into the lie. And then ultimately, you just say, what the heck? I'm just going to buy the eclair. I'm going to eat it. And you're a heart attack waiting to happen. So the last thing is I need to focus my mind. I need to feed my mind. I need to free my mind. I need to focus my mind. God wants us to take our thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. So there's all kinds of lies and deceptions out there. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. He says, but our warfare is not a physical one. Our warfare is a spiritual one. And how we're going to win this battle over Satan, over temptation, over destructive, your ability to enjoy life, is you have got to take control of this thing. Reel in your emotions and get them in line with God's Word. Philippians 4.8, and we're going to close with this verse. I need, to, I need to focus my mind on those things. I need to focus my mind on God's Word. Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, brothers, Whatever's true, I want you to think on these things. Don't be thinking on things that are lies and accusations. No things that you know that you know that you know are true. Rather than believing the worst about people, why don't we think honorable thoughts about that person and not give Satan room? Whatever's honorable, think about those things. Whatever's just, think about those things. Whatever's pure, think about those things. Whatever's lovely, think about those things. Whatever's commendable, think about those things. Is there any excellence? Think on those things. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you'll spend your time and your mind and your emotions thinking on the good things, not the bad things, not the, oh, woe is me, oh, how sorry and miserable my life is, In two months, your body will be now able to enjoy life. So some of you right now are stuck. Some of you have had some stinking thinking going on. Maybe your circumstances are actually good. But in here, Satan's been playing a heyday in your life. And you need to stop it. You need to tell him to take a hike. You need to take control of your emotions and your thoughts and begin to align them with God's thoughts. And you need to feed your soul. You need to feed the righteous puppy of Christ in you. And it will win. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to close the service. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Templeton. There are some people who need to give their lives to Jesus Christ. There's going to be some people available at the front of the church to pray for you. Guys, we're going to respond to this message, and we're also going to respond by taking up our tithes and offerings. 